Luther and the Scriptures. So first topic. Our topic today, Luther and the Scriptures, cannot be confined to this lecture alone, but inevitably will spill over into the other themes in this series, since the Bible was so central to Luther's experience and theology. As we trace the themes of the Bible through these lectures, it might be useful to conceptually separate, number one, the Bible as a source of doctrinal authority, including, including ecclesiology, from the Bible as a source of religious and devotional life, as well as the Bible as a physical object. This lecture will certainly not exhaustively address all of these aspects. And this is especially the case with respect to the Bible as a source of religious authority, since it is so inseparable from Luther's conflict with the papacy, which is the subject of next week's lecture. So this issue will continue to come up. And also when we talk in the third week about justification by faith, and certainly when we talk in the fourth week about Luther and the sacraments, Luther and the Bible will keep coming up. But nevertheless, we're going to dive into it here. Uh, one, uh, the Bible before Luther. This is, by the way, uh, a Bible with, I'm not allowed to step away from the mic here. This, by the way, is a Bible with gloss. Uh, what you see here uh, is, are the openings, chapters of the book of Genesis. And if you can do the I, right? And if you look really closely in those large slides, it says, In principium creavit, in the beginning created, and God is right there. So this is the text here, right? And as you can see, it is surrounded by commentary. And this is how most people would have experienced the Bible if they had one in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, a little bit of text surrounded by an enormous amount of uh, gloss, uh, which is uh, commentary. So we'll talk more about that in a minute, but that, that's what that is. The Bible, uh, Latin and vernacular. One myth that seems to come up quite a bit in the discussion of the Reformation generally, and in the context of this 500th anniversary in particular, is that the church in the Middle Ages hid the Bible from the laity by keeping the Bible in Latin, and refusing to let them read it. This is actually untrue. Uh, the church in the Bible and uh, the church in the Middle Ages never me, the church in the Middle Ages never forbade laity to read the Bible, nor, with a few exceptions, particularly in England, did they ever prohib prohibit the translation of the Bible into vernacular languages like German, Italian, French, and others. Laity were prohibited from preaching without authorization from church officials. But they were free to read the Bible uh, in what was essentially the official church version, the Latin Vulgate, if they chose. They were also free to read it in their own languages. One of the vernacular Bibles, that is to say not in Latin, but the language of the people, vernacular, that was printed on that technological marvel, the printing press. The first Bible in German was published in 1466. This is an early German Bible here. I've got a book on the table there that has um, uh, uh, examples from all of the early German Bibles that were printed on the printing press before the age of Luther. If you want to look through those, they're kind of interesting. Uh, the first one in Italian was printed in 1471, French 1474, Dutch 1477, among other languages. Printed German translations of the Bible were not only the earliest, but also the most numerous, with 18 different German editions of the Bible printed between 1466 and 1522, which was the year that Martin Luther published his New Testament in German. Now, there is a little bit of something to the story about the church keeping the Bible from the laity that makes this claim at least understandable. First, this charge goes back to the earliest days of the Reformation. Protestant reformers themselves often wrote similar things, that the Catholic Church was hiding the words from the scripture, of the scriptures, from simple Christians. Okay, you often hear Protestant reformers themselves saying these sorts of things. To an extent, this is polemics. Okay? To an extent, it is perception. 
and to an extent they are referencing a religious culture where active reading of the Bible by the laity is not encouraged. Martin Luther makes this point in his famous 1520 writing, The Pagan Servitude of the Church, sometimes called the Babylonian Captivity of the Church. Speaking of the words of institution spoken in Latin in the Mass, Luther says, quote, What we deplore in the servitude of the Church is that the priests take every care, now in days, lest any of the laity hear the words of Christ. It is as if they were too sacred to be uttered to the common people. So Luther himself indulges in this kind of uh, rhetoric. Second, the Catholic Church, its first index of prohibited books from 1559, reissued as the Tridentine Index from 1564. So not till 1559 did the Catholic Church have an official position on books that could and could not be read by faithful Catholics. Not until 1559 was there any document published by the Catholic Church prohibiting any particular books to be read or allowing other books to be read. Okay. Now that one from 1559 and then again in 1664 did put substantial restrictions on the lady reading the Bible and especially the Bible in the vernacular. But as is often unfortunately the case, later developments in religion, politics, and culture from the 16th and 17th centuries get read back into the Middle Ages where the situation often was actually less restrictive and authoritarian than it would become in later centuries. Third, it would be fair to say that there was not in the Middle Ages a culture of Bible reading or biblical-oriented piety. And while this certainly had much to do with the fact that less than 10% of the population could read, uh, it was also true that the church did nothing to cultivate an interest in the Bible among medieval Christians. And I don't think, as we'll talk about later, it would be unfair to suggest that they did a fair amount to discourage it. The medieval experience of the Bible. That, by the way, is a Gutenberg, uh, that's an image of a, of a Gutenberg Bible. We'll talk in a little bit about what is important about that image, what that tells us. So, what was the Bible in the Middle Ages for most people? Uh, first, it was mostly a concept, not a book, as we understand it today. Most Bibles, again, were heavily glossed, like that image that we saw uh, earlier. Commentary woven above, below, around, and sometimes between the lines. So with all those extra words, a complete Bible might have constituted as many as 12 handwritten volumes. And most libraries would have possessed at most only a few of those sections of the Bible, maybe the Gospels or the Letters of Paul or the Pentateuch or something like that. Most, most libraries wouldn't have had a full set. And people wouldn't have experienced it as a book like in the modern world, we experience it as a book. That is to say, until the 1400s, when something called great Bibles emerge. Now, these are single volume Bibles chained to a podium in cathedrals or monasteries or monastery churches. The famous Gutenberg Bible and other early printed Bibles were meant to serve this purpose. Large, showy, fancy, expensive, but without gloss or commentary. You notice here, it's just the text of the Bible. Remember that first one we saw, uh, we saw where there was all that commentary all around the side, making it quite large. The Gutenberg Bible, as you can see, is just the text of the Bible. That means they were not really meant to be read or studied. And most of these, um, these kinds of Bibles come down to us uh, showing very few signs of use. They were objects to look at. Martin Luther himself mentioned that there was a large Bible like this one chained at the podium of his monastery, but no one read it. They functioned really as potent religious relics or as tangible manifestations of religious authority, not as something to read or study. The Bible, thus, had an aura about it of distance and power. But most precisely, it was considered a book for specialists theologians, canon lawyers, church officials. It was not a book for general Christian use. 
It just was not. Just like this is a silly metaphor, but it's the only one I could think of. Just like, although you all, we all could go out and buy a surgical manual explaining how to remove an appendix. And although there are a few people who might be crazy enough to try, most people would never consider going out, buying the manuals, reading them over, and then attempting to remove somebody's appendix. Right? These books are for medical professionals. And although you could technically go get your hands on one and read it, most people would consider it to be not really for them. And if a movement emerged, this is taking the analogy maybe a little too far, but we're going to go with it. And if a movement emerged of amateur surgeons, you see where I'm going with this, right? Who bought and read surgical manuals and then operated on each other, right? It is certain that the AMA would swiftly begin issue stern warnings, right? About how these books cannot be understood without the proper training and about how in the wrong hands they can do severe damage and about how these things really need to be left to the experts. Okay? And most people, frankly, would probably agree. They would say, yeah, this is not really for you. Okay? You can buy the book, right? You can look at the diagrams, but really, without the proper training, you shouldn't be doing this. These books aren't really for you. Similarly, the Bible, you see, the, see where I'm going here, right? The Bible was considered to be a difficult and complex book that could not be understood without the proper theological training. The Bible was only studied by theology students and them only through the glosses. You read the glosses to understand the text. The glosses were, by the way, largely excerpts from early theologians, church fathers, other prominent theologians, helping guide the novice through the scripture and come to its proper understanding. For you to just pick it up, yourself as an untrained layman and expect to discover in it the truth about God and the path to salvation would seem as preposterous and dangerous to them as it would for us for you to pick up a surgical manual online used and read it over and then try to remove your own appendix. Not for no reason was the Bible called the heretics book, or the book for heretics. In the wrong and untrained hand, the Bible could easily be misunderstood, and this could lead to heresy and ultimately to perdition. Medieval biblical knowledge. So, how did the average Christian in the Middle Ages know anything about the Bible at all? Fair question, right? Admittedly, the transmission process could be a little scattered. But over time, a fair amount of biblical knowledge did get conveyed. Oh, well, there were, of course, the images in the churches, the, the, the paintings, the statues, the stained glass, right? sometimes called the Bible of the poor. I don't know how really true that is, but um, there were those, right? And there, of course, is Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, they're just getting in trouble there. You see God is you know, coming after them there in the garden. Um, there was that, okay? In the later Middle Ages, sermons in the vernacular became much more common. Uh, sometimes these were mendicant friars, Dominicans and Franciscans going around the country preaching. Sometimes they were endowed preacherships uh, that were uh, set up in large and prosperous cities for people to come and hear preaching. It was done in their own language. Okay? Now, admittedly, the content was varied. Or there were saint stories and other kind of moral tales that were told, but a fair amount of biblical information was also conveyed in these sermons. Okay. Clergy were supposed to provide catechetical instruction to their congregation. Again, a bit scattered, but it did happen. And when you did it, you were supposed to at least explain the Ten Commandments in the Lord's Prayer. At least. So, biblical knowledge does come through that instruction. Now, at least once a year also, you're a good Catholic in the Middle Ages, you're supposed to go to confession at least once a year to confession. And in that confession, the good and faithful priest, not all priests were as good and faithful as others, but the good and faithful priest would question the person about their faith, and this would, and knowledge about their faith, and this would provide also an opportunity for instruction. Okay. This did happen. 
Not as much as the church wanted, but it did happen. Right? Christians who were receiving uh, education often stayed in boarding houses if, for secondary education uh, or in colleges if they were at university. And it was often the case that the Bible would be read during mealtimes. So there's that. Uh, finally, in the later Middle Ages, devotional literature, as literacy rates are going up, devotional literature for the laity is becoming more popular. Some of that devotional literature, like this movement called, we call the Devotio Moderna, the modern devotion, that was very heavily centered around Bible stories. Um, but all of it to at least some extent reference stories in the Bible, at least the most familiar stories, and of course key moments in the life of Jesus. Two. Luther's early experience with the Bible. So, we assume that Luther had that very same sort of background that I just outlined. Now he's from upwardly mobile peasant and uh, medium town city dwelling family. Now he's on, the family's on their way up. Father is a prosperous miner and entrepreneur from a peasant household. Uh, his mother is uh, from the sort of the middle class of a local city. Uh, so he's, he's in that kind of a mix. He's not desperately poor. He's not, he's particularly wealthy. He's in that kind of middle mix, an upwardly mobile middle, That's sort of where he is um, growing up. So we assume he had that same kind of basic background that most other people in his era had. So then where did his extraordinary interest in the Bible come from? For there are many accounts that suggest that he was drawn to the Bible in an extraordinary way, a way that deeply impressed some and mildly alarmed others. But many people comment on it. Naturally, he was exposed to the Bible in all the ways we just discussed. But there doesn't seem to have been anything particular about his early experience. Luther claims that he never even saw a Bible until he was 20. When he came across one as a master's degree student at the library at the University of Erfurt. First time he ever saw one in his life. When he entered the monastery, however, now I'm referencing some background material in that early lecture. Uh, go back and look at it. I guess that's what I would say. Uh, he enters a monastery in 1505 after a dramatic religious experience that he has. Uh, and there, his contact with the Bible naturally grows. Uh, the Bible was, he's an Augustinian friar, okay? and the Bible was read during meals at the Augustinian monastery, so he heard it being read. As a novice monk, right after he enters the monastery, the only Bible, the only book he was allowed to read was the Bible. He took away all his other books, and he voraciously read a copy over and over and over again that was provided to him. Also, the vicar general of the observant Augustinian order, the head of his monastic order, a man named Johann von Staupitz, who also shows up in the introductory lecture, right? who Luther knew personally, but was himself unusually interested in the Bible and in cultivating a biblically-centered piety. Because he himself, Staupitz, was also, in, the head, in addition to being the head of the Augustinian observant order, was a professor of the Bible at the University of Wittenberg. And certainly this had an impact on Luther. Later on, when he was studying scholastic theology for his doctorate in theology, he would still find time to visit the monastery library and read the Bible. But this, already noted, is highly unusual behavior and begs the question, why was he doing this? When everybody else in the monastery a group of people with largely the same experiences and background and a sense of exposures were not. They all could have been doing this too. They were all observant Augustinians. They all were under Johann von Staupitz. They all had the Bible read to them every day. They, but they weren't doing this. Why was Luther? Fair question. Some of this simply lies in the mystery of the human personality or as Luther would insist, the mystery of the divine calling. And so the answer, we will never fully recover that answer. However, 
a big piece of the puzzle probably lies in the Psalms. Okay? That is a Psalter, by the way. 150 Psalms make up the Psalter. It is sung, that's why you have the notation there. Okay. An example of a, of a Psalter that would have been used by a monk, probably, in the singing of the Psalms. The most intense contact that a monk would have with the Bible was to be found in the praying of the Psalms. Monks would gather together for public prayer eight times a day for a total of about four hours a day of public prayer. That's not to the public like outside, but among themselves, not private in their cells, but together public prayer. That's what I mean by that. And the majority of that time would be spent praying or chanting the Psalms. In fact, over the course of a week, generally, monks would pray or chant through all 150 Psalms every week. The whole Psalter every week. So, over the course of a long lifetime, a monk might well pray through all of the Psalms thousands of times. Luther had an intense but ambivalent relationship with the Psalms. First, as I did talk about in this introductory lecture, you can go check this out, Luther was a particularly scrupulous monk. He was intent on performing his monastic duties correctly. He wanted to make sure that he had done enough. With regard to the Psalms, this involved having both a correct understanding of the Psalms and having the right internal disposition of reverence and devotion. He needed to understand what he was praying and do it with the right attitude. That would do his, that would, then he would have done his monastic duties correctly. This requirement disturbed Luther because he believed he did not understand the Psalms and because he believed that no one else in the monastery understood the Psalms either. This is in addition to the fact that he was sometimes tired or sick or cold or distracted and he would catch himself praying the Psalms by rote and not with the heart. In this way, the Psalms worked to increase Luther's already troubled conscience, his anxiety, his fear that he had yet again failed a harsh God of judgment. This anxiety and this dread was only enhanced by certain verses in the Psalms that spoke of God's righteousness. From Psalm 31, these are just a few examples. In your righteousness, deliver me. Or from Psalm 71, give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. The idea of God's righteousness terrified him. How could he, Luther, a sinner, be delivered in God's righteous judgment, would he not instead be condemned, consumed, destroyed? And how could he give the son his righteousness when he felt like he didn't have any righteousness at all to give? However, these experiences, instead of driving Luther away from the Bible, drove him further into it. He strove to understand the meaning of these difficult concepts that disturbed him. And as he did, he made some that he believed to be remarkable discoveries. First, he discovered that the Psalms are a book for the crushed, the fearful, the anxious, those on the knife edge between despair and hope. Again and again, the author of the Psalms cries out to God in fear, in anxiety, in torment, in confusion, in pain. In this way, the Psalms confirmed Luther's own personal experiences. Because that's how he felt. And affirmed, strangely enough, that this attitude is the proper attitude of the true believer. But how could this remarkable book both provoke these feelings and assuage them? How could it affirm that it is precisely the true Christian 
that is crushed under the righteous judgment of God. Luther sensed that he had a hit on the way out of his problems, that he had uncovered something profound. But he knew that at this point, he only vaguely grasped what he had discovered, and that intense work would be needed to struggle his way to clarity. This realization forms the basis of the theology of the cross, which again, you can go read about in the, uh, you can go watch in the first lecture and you'll see that there are a lot of parallels here between what I'm discussing and the theology that emerges for Luther in the year, let's say 1508 to 1508 to 1515. He's working out of this discovery that he finds in the Psalms. Uh, that the true Christian is the one uh, who is actually the judged Christian, the Christian who is crushed, the Christian who embraces his condemnation, a strange kind of middle ground for Luther between what's going to be his Reformation teaching on justification by faith that we'll talk about next week and the more medieval view of salvation, which is a cooperative effort between human works and God's grace. So a strange middle ground position, but and uh, you can see we be talking about it in that lecture uh, on the Theologian Residence website. But that's where he is right now in this period. Another thing he discovers, reading the Psalms intensely, and it is that the scriptures have their own voice, their own terminology, their own way of speaking and thinking that Luther found to be foreign to the modes of medieval theology that he was accustomed to. He was a professor of theology. He had studied intensely medieval theology. He knew it better than any of us know it. Right? And he found that the language of the Bible and the language of medieval theology were so profoundly different that they couldn't even talk to each other. With its use of formal language, with its use of speculative thought, with its approach that framed questions using the terms and categories of Greek philosophy, particularly the philosophy of Aristotle. This was not helping him understand the voice of the scripture. So he felt like the key to unpacking the meaning of the Bible had to be found in the Bible itself and in the use of the language of the Bible itself. He's beginning to move all the way, already away from uh, scholastic theology. And he was eager eager, it seems, to turn to the Apostle Paul, who also wrote extensively about God's righteousness, the concept that deeply troubled him, but that he increasingly sensed might also paradoxically be the solution to his spiritual problems. Just starting another section here. Trying to decide if we want a break or if you want to plow ahead for another 10 minutes. Plow ahead for another 10 minutes. Okay, that's very good. I like that. Let's plow ahead for another 10 minutes. Then we will, uh, then we will take a break. Oops, going backwards. Three, Luther as translator of the Bible. This is, by the way, the room in the Wartburg. Has anyone been there? No? 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 Um, this is the castle where Luther was hiding out after the Diet of Worms, and this is the place, this is the room where he translated uh, the Bible into German. So, his, of his room where he did that translation work. Luther is, and there's a picture of him up there in the 1520s with the big beard. He's got that uh, millennial, he got that millennial beard going on there. Yeah. I don't know where that came from, but it's back, isn't it? As discussed in the preliminary lecture, as professor of scripture at the University of Wittenberg, Luther's most important professional task was to expound the Bible, right? He was a professor of Bible at the University of Wittenberg. That was his job, right? And so a couple times a week, this is again in the introductory lecture, he would go into the lecture hall and he would explain the Bible to his students. That was his task. And in that capacity, he worked his way through the Psalms, the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. In the process, his conviction grew that the Bible belonged at the heart of the life of the church and the experience of the individual Christian. 
he did mean this in terms of binding authority, that the scripture alone stood as the final arbitrator of all matters of Christian doctrine, devotional life, church polity, standing above in judgment and not together with the Pope, the councils, the tradition, canon law, reason, the church fathers, all of that. Stood above it, not together with it. But even more so, he came to think of the scriptures as the living word of God. Something that speaks alive, speaks directly into the lives of Christians, especially experientially, directly, killing and making alive. We'll talk more about that later. Now let's go to some of Luther's sources here. The most significant and lasting expression of Luther's commitment to the centrality of the Bible was his translation of the entire Bible into German. This way, the way for this project was paved by the Dutch humanist Christian, someone said Erasmus. Yes, the Dutch humanist Desiderius Erasmus, the Dutch scholar, prince of Christian humanists, king of the northern humanists, who in 1516 published the Greek text of the New Testament together with the Latin Vulgate corrected in a parallel column. He also at the end published extensive notes on the Greek text and the meaning of difficult words and phrases. In 1519, this one, he issued a second edition, replacing the Latin Vulgate with his own new Latin translation. This is a, this is a cover page of the 1519th. <coughs> 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 Sorry, should have taken a break. Um, this is a cover page of the 1519 edition of Erasmus. Interestingly enough, the program of revising the text of the Vulgate according to the original Greek and Hebrew sources was taking place at that time under the auspices of none other than the Catholic Church, uh, sometimes with explicit support from the Pope. There had, that, at that point, never been one unitary form of the Vulgate. That is the official Latin, or has come to be the official Latin uh, translation of the, of the Bible. There was never one unitary form of it. Right? Although the Gutenberg Bible uh, actually picked the winner because the text, the Parisian text that it used, became the text for all subsequent publications of the Latin Vulgate. So that's how it really kind of gets solidified. But at the time, uh, many in the church were hoping to clear things up by a careful study of the biblical text in the original languages. So this was going on quite regularly. And it was not until the Protestant reformers weaponized this process and turned it against the Catholic Church that the practice of revising the Vulgate according to the original sources became suspect. This happens only later on and the church hardened around a received text of the Vulgate. At the time, however, although there was a bit of grumbling, Erasmus's work was widely praised. And uh, Erasmus had actually uh, primarily uh, been interested in revising the Latin. He just gave the Greek, the original Greek there, so people could check it. But what people became really interested in, ironically, was that Greek text because that would allow them to do their own translation work of the New Testament, and they could bypass Erasmus's Latin translation entirely, translated, for example, into vernacular languages, like, well, as we'll see, German. And this is what Luther did, right? That Greek text from that 1519 edition was what allowed Luther to translate the Bible into German from the original, from the original Greek language, the New Testament, of course. Erasmus paved the way for Luther's translation in a second important way, though. Erasmus and other Christian humanists had long since advocated for a more simple, more biblical piety centered around the life and teachings of Jesus. 
and they were especially hostile to what they perceived as medieval, barbaric superstitions. The veneration of images, worshiping relics, fixation on mythical saints' lives, ridiculous miracle stories, as they would put all of that, right? and particularly the trade and indulgences. Erasmus, in this 1519 edition of his Novum Testamentum, goes even further and in his preface says that simple Christians themselves should have access to the text of the scriptures. The famous phrase that gets picked up by other reformers later when Erasmus says, I would to God that the plowman would sing a text of the scripture at his plow and that the weaver would hum them to the tune of his shuttle. Again, at this time, comments like this passed largely without objection. Translation project. Let's talk about this a few pages and then we'll take a break. We've got another five minutes or so. Luther and his compatriots in Wittenberg had been contemplating a translation of the New Testament since late 1520. But by the end of 1521, Luther was finally persuaded to undertake the task. With a bit of help from his friends in Wittenberg, and plenty of help from Erasmus's notes, because Luther's, German, Luther's Greek was not really that great, uh, he translated the whole New Testament in 11 weeks. By March of 1522, the text was ready to be sent to the publishers. The first run of Luther's New Testament came out in September 1522. That's a uh, image of the cover page of the first uh, of that New Testament. It's very scrolly. It's hard to read, but it says Das Neue Testament Deutsch there, and then underneath the small letters it says uh, Wittenberg. A copy uh, sold two to three thousand copies, sold out right away. A revised copy came out in December, and Wittenberg's three printing presses could not keep up with demand. Other German presses stepped in pumping the mark gets full of unauthorized copies. It is estimated that between September 1522 and the end of 1525, at least 86,000 copies of Luther's New Testament was published. That is one for every seven literate Germans, assuming a 5% literacy rate. That would be the equivalent of about 40 million copies of a book being sold in the United States in just over a three year period. And the book was not cheap, about a week's wages of a skilled artisan. And that was for the unbound copy. The New Testament, however, carried not only the message of the Bible, but also the message of Luther and the Wittenberg Reformation. Although Luther would, of course, say they were one and the same, right? Uh, each Bible carried a general, the Bible carried a general preface, and each book had an introduction, and in the margins were many notes glosses. All of this material was written by Martin Luther himself. Some of the content was general scholarly information intended to aid an understanding. Some of it was polemical attack against the Catholic Church. But much of it, some have estimated about 40% of it, consisted of Martin Luther's key Reformation teachings on things like justification by faith alone. Luther swiftly began to the translation of the Old Testament. It was at first published in parts. The Pentateuch was published in 1524. And the other parts of the New Testament came out over another eight year period or so. Finally, by 1534, I've got an image of this later on, the entire Bible was published, translated into German. The first text of the Hebrew scriptures was printed in 1488. And Christian humanists, especially in Florence and in Venice, had been studying Hebrew since the early 1400s. Okay. By the time Luther had undertaken his translation work of the Old Hebrew Old Testament, there were also a number of Hebrew grammars and dictionaries available for Christians to study, coming out really in the late 1400s, early 1500s. However, the discipline among Christians was of studying Hebrew texts was still quite young. And Luther and his team of translators found themselves struggling mightily 
over the still many difficult and obscure passages, especially in the poetical books, and most especially in the book of Job, which they said almost sunk them. You ever read Job? You might understand why that would be the case. But it finally came out. And at over two guilders per copy, that is about a month's wages for a skilled artisan. A lot of money. However, between 1534 and the year of Luther's death, the Wittenberg printers issued over 100,000 copies. That's just in Wittenberg. And many more of them were issued by unauthorized printers across Germany. Hugely popular. So, after the break, uh, we're going to ask the question, what accounts for the extraordinary popularity of Luther's Bible? And what does that say about ultimately what's going to be a new culture of the Bible that Luther will be creating almost single-handedly in Germany? So uh, keep that question in mind. We're going to take, uh, Dr. Williams, how many minutes? We're going to take a see the source of the appeal of Luther's Bible. And there's a woodcut of a 16th century um, printing shop. That is. Uh, so, what accounts for the extraordinary popularity of Luther's Bible? It will be recalled that there were numerous editions of German Bibles that had been published in the years before the Luther edition came out. Most of them in relatively small runs. 16th century printers, let's see, 16th century printers were a capitalistic entrepreneurial lot. They published whatever the market demanded and didn't really care where they got their materials from. If people had wanted more German Bibles, printers would have published them. So something must have changed that can account for the explosive popularity of Luther's Bible. What might that be? There's the man, Luther himself. Uh, here's an early woodcut of Luther in the early years, in the early 1520s. He's still in his monk's uh, cowl there. Uh, he has his tonsure, and you see he's St. Luther uh, with the nimbus, the, the halo around him, the Holy Spirit coming down on him as a dove, inspiring his interpretation of that book down there in the far right corner, uh, the scripture. Now do you see uh, this sort of uh, uh, saint-like uh, Luther being portrayed here uh, by one of his early followers in the form of a woodcut? The first answer to this question of why did people read the Luther Bible was Luther. Uh, by 1522, Luther was already an international celebrity, the most prolific author in Germany. It's estimated that between 1500 and 1530, Luther's writings made up 20% of all pamphlets published in Germany. In the years 1518 to 1525, the dates sort of surrounding the publication of his New Testament. Luther published almost four times more pamphlets. Pamphlets are what we call are the sort of the shorter books. They're called Flugschriften in German. Shorter books. Um, four times as many pamphlets as the next most prolific German author. People read Luther. They discussed Luther. They loved or they hated Luther. When Luther's New Testament came out, people naturally wanted a copy. Even his opponents bought it and read it to refute him, so they said. Two, Luther's translation. This is, by the way, a um, 1534 uh, public, uh, print of his entire, um, the entire Bible translated into uh, German. That's the 1534 edition. That's the first edition that came out. You can see it's good size. See how substantial it is. Uh, earlier translations of uh, the Bible had been literal, uh, what we call word for word translations from Latin. Uh, that resulted in uh, odd phrasing, uh, strange word order, unfamiliar idioms. German readers found these early versions of the Bible to be difficult to understand and unpleasant to read. Why were they like this? Well, there was a clear reluctance to stray at all from the Vulgate. First, because of a certain reverence for it, 
Uh, and secondly, out of a motive of what you might call self-preservation. Um, by translating freely, you might accidentally compose something that somebody thought sounded sort of like heresy. Stick to the text, the literal translation of the text, and you will be safe. Second, the intended audience for these vernacular translations of the Bibles tended not to be laity. They tended more so to be clergy with bad Latin, of which there were very many. So uh, the idea was this, that the priest would take the vernacular Bible and lay beside it the Vulgate Bible right, and use the vernacular Bible as an aid to help in the understanding of difficult words and phrases in the Latin. So it was a translation aid, mostly. Um, although people read it for other reasons, that was sort of how it was conceived. So uh, kind of like an interlinear, some people have you ever seen like an interlinear Bible where you've got the Greek or the Hebrew text and above it you have sort of a literal translation with English words above it, sort of like an early version of that. And for that reason, a literal translation that stuck directly to the text of the Latin Vulgate would have been most helpful. Finally, got a cough drop in. Sorry. Um, the prevailing uh, norm for translation in the Middle Ages was what uh, they would call it ad verbum. That means literally, or you know, by the word, to the word, literally, word for word. Okay, and so that's uh, the way we translated things in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so that's how the Bible was translated, literally, word for word. Luther scraps this entire translation approach. In the 15th century Renaissance, humanists brought back a classical approach to translation, which was called ad sensum. And you can guess um, what that means. Uh, according to the sense of the passage. The idea was not to translate word for word, but to convey the sense of the passage in a way that captures the meaning of the author, but in the idiom of the reader. Luther adopted this method completely. His German Bible sounded like good German, not like another language translated into German. He used as his foundation, by the way, the court German of his Saxon rulers, a kind of dialect that was spoken broadly in imperial circles throughout Germany. And then he added to it more popular phrases, words, sayings, idioms that made it sound like a people's book. Right? And it allowed Germans to see themselves in the pages of the Bible. Luther also happens to have been one of the greatest wordsmiths in German history. And this is part of the story as well. He had an amazing sense for words and sounds and phrasing. He could make text shine. He could make them resonate. His translation is universally considered to be a monument of German literature. So you can't take that personal element away from it as well. There is something about Luther's power with words. And so those are, all, those are all part of it. The third piece of it, the question why, when the Bible was available, you could have read it, but nobody read it, and then suddenly it's flying off the shelves and people can't get enough of it, and the printers are printing 24 hours a day and they can't keep up with what happened. Those are two possible explanations, partial explanations, I guess you could say. The third one, I'll suggest, um, is a little broader, and it's Luther... Uh, as the creator of a new culture of the Bible. The Bible was available before Luther, but hardly anyone read it. Why would you? It was an obscure book. It was confusing. You were told, for specialists only, not meant for you. What would you find there if you were to read it? A book full of strange laws, bizarre customs of an ancient world that had passed away. The church had long since extracted the sap, as they said, and distilled it into the teachings you needed to avoid evil in this world and reach heaven safely. 
follow the teachings of the church, make use of the sacraments, live a good life, you will be fine. You will be fine. Start mucking around in the Bible, and I'll bet you're off, right? Who knows? Luther challenged all of that. When Luther's Bible appeared in 1522, he had been in the public eye now for almost five years. His writings had been flooding the German markets since 1518. Constantly in his writings, Luther referenced the Bible. He quoted the Bible. He explained the Bible. He appealed to the Bible. He held up centuries of church teaching and practice against the authority of the Bible and declared those to be lacking or invalid. People read Luther, or they heard Luther read, or they heard Luther discussed, and they drew basically three conclusions. First, the Bible is a source of spiritual comfort and consolation. There's the good doctor himself with the Bible in his hand. There are one nice thing about doing a lecture on Luther. There are so many pictures, paintings, woodcuts, drawings of Luther that were made during his lifetime. You never have any trouble finding pictures for a PowerPoint slide. There are just hundreds of them. So now here is one of them. Uh, Luther in kind of middle age there with his Bible uh, next to it. Uh, is Christ, and then up on the left, that is his personal seal up there. Uh, it's the heart with the um, cross in the middle. So, uh, anyhow, there's Luther. Source of spiritual comfort and consolation. I suppose he is receiving comfort here as he reads the Bible that points to Christ. I think that's probably the message here. Um, some of Luther's writings were polemical or doctrinal. He would attack the Pope, or he would talk about church teachings and doctrine. Some of it was that. But most of his writings were actually expositional or devotional. Mostly, he was a devotional writer. Although that's not what gets read, most of what he wrote was actually devotional for people, average people, to read in a devotional, pious sort of way. Often, these devotional writings took the form of a sermon, where Luther would expound on a text from the Bible, and he would make that text connect with the lives of the listeners, whether they were experiencing trouble or confusion or guilt or doubt. And then he would have the living word, we'll talk more about this later, the living word of the scriptures speak into their lives, the living word for them, which he believed would bring them comfort or solace, forgiveness, peace, grace, he sought to convey to the listeners his own experiences of the Bible, that it was his source of consolation in times of trouble, and that what he believed was that it was only the study of the Bible that had brought him out of his personal pit. And people then, as they read this, began to understand the Bible in a new way, not as a specialist's book, full of arcane and strange matters that are difficult to understand, but as a vital source of personal spiritual comfort and solace and power, the place where God himself chooses to meet Christian people and do his work. Here the Bible is the only reliable authority. That's St. Jerome, by the way. He's the translator of the Latin Vulgate. He's there translating away. That's an image of. Again and again, Luther referenced the authority of the scriptures in his conflict with the church. Centuries of settled church teachings on scores of matters were held up to the standard of the scriptures and, according to Luther, declared invalid. Purgatory, the invocation of the saints, and Mary, clerical celibacy, monastic vows, the authority of the Pope, the authority of church councils, most of the seven sacraments, just to begin with, invalidated. Just like that. According to Luther, the church that people trusted, the doctrines that everyone believed, the practices that everyone followed, were to a shocking extent wrong. Deeply, severely, dangerously wrong. Wrong. 
For those who accepted Luther's conclusions, it cannot be underestimated how these implications shook their world like an earthquake. The church and the scriptures, according to Luther, were not aligned, something that I'm, people would always presume that they were. Rather, they were in key respects at odds with each other. It's shocking. It's unnerving. But the consequences were for many people clear. And the consequence they drew from it was this, away with human authority. There can be no more reliance on the unreliable traditions of men. Scripture alone must be our guide. Many people drew from Luther's writings exactly that conclusion. C. Here's where it gets a little dangerous. Not just specialists, not just professionals. This is a image that I discussed uh, in that earlier lecture, and um, you can go back and look at it. Uh, but here, just briefly, here is um, God the Father up here. Okay. And uh, here is Christ. This is called the divine mill. Here is Christ, and he is pouring the four Gospels into this mill. Uh, out of it uh, is coming grain. Uh, that is being picked up by none other than our friend Erasmus. Uh, and is being baked into bread by Luther. Uh, meanwhile, there are a whole bunch of popes and cardinals and monks here who are getting beaten to death. Uh, by a peasant. So, take that. Okay, this is what we're this is what we're talking about here. We're about to get beaten to death by a peasant. We got a man who's named Karstans, who's a that's like a, a Jacobian or something. That's a that's a that's a keyword for a, a a peasant who's got some sort of violent designs. Um. All right, not just specialists, not just professionals. It gets a little dangerous here. Luther did not believe in what we will come to call later the perspicuity of Scripture. Anyone ever hear that term? Perspicuity of Scripture. Uh, that's a good fundamentalist doctrine. Uh, it held that the Bible's meanings are self-evident to the common reader. No special scholarly skills or training is necessary to understand its meaning. Okay, open it up, read it. The truth of it is there for you. Okay. Luther did not believe that. It is 1522 New Testament, it will be recalled, right? It was full of notes, prefaces, introductions, all kinds of tools and instruments to guide the reader into the proper understanding of the text. Now, Luther indeed did hold that key texts of the Christian faith were knowable to the reader approaching the text in good will. Uh, he's thinking things about things like justification by faith, and as we'll see in chapter, in lecture four, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Right? Here in the scripture, God expresses the most important things necessary for salvation clearly. He also believed, though, that there were many obscure and baffling passages in the scripture that could, if misunderstood, mislead the simple reader. There was always in his mind an important role for the scholar and the interpreter, for the professor of Bible. That's him, right? Okay. For the professor of Bible. There's always that important role for that person in the process of achieving accurate biblical understanding. Admittedly, though, Luther could be somewhat ambiguous on this point. And in places in his early writings, he often made it sound like regular people should take the Bible in their hands and refute the Pope and his lies. And many people thought that he then had license to do exactly that. Very soon, what happens? People who originally associated themselves with Luther's movement, often lay people without a formal degree or called a religious office, found in their readings of the Bible teachings and doctrines that were widely at variance with what Luther thought was in the Bible. Hmm. This allowed Luther to clarify, at least on paper, and perhaps also, frankly, in his own mind, 
I think, his position on the issue of laity reading the Bible. Here is what I would say is his settled position on this matter. All Christians should read the Bible devotionally to receive comfort, encouragement, consolation from God, who meets with people there himself in the text. The interpretation of the Bible, however, that is the discernment of doctrine, of true teaching, should be in the hands who have been formally trained and educated and have received a formal call as a pastor or a teacher in a church under the authority of a local government. That is his settled position on this matter. Devotionally, everyone should read the Bible. Through doctrine and teaching, that still is in the hands of the professionals. That's the conclusion that he comes to after much difficulty in the 1520s. Um, and the book that Dr. Williams uh, so generously mentioned that I wrote has a fair amount to do with with that, that problem. Uh, that people are finding all kinds of things in the Bible in the 1520s. And um, what are you going to do about that? Okay. Uh, but, right, for Luther, right, the cat's pretty much out of the bag by this point, and all his efforts are never going to be able to rein people back into that understanding that he has of interpreting the Bible. Now, where does this idea come from, that people might be able to read and interpret the Bible for themselves? The theoretical framework within which the laity are seen as having the right to read and interpret the Bible for themselves derives its validity from Luther's position that we have come to call the priesthood of all believers. If you've ever heard anything about Luther, if that's one of the key phrases that comes up associated with him and his teaching. Luther articulates this position most clearly in his 1520 writing to the Christian nobility of the German nation, another one of these really famous 1520 writings of Luther's. In this book, Luther calls on the German nobility to reform the church. He asserts that the papacy has protected itself against reform with three walls that must first be knocked down. Here's his vision of these noble men on naive knights and dukes and you know, men of arms, and what do they want to do? Knock down walls. So he says, here's a, the papacy has fortified itself with these walls. Now, boys, go knock them down. Um, the first wall is the papacy claims that the church and its officials stand above the government and its, and its officials and cannot be judged by them in any way. The second wall, the papists claim, the papacy claims that they have the right to interpret the scripture alone and so cannot be judged or rebuked by it, by anyone else, because the authority to interpret it is in their hands. The third, and this will come up next week, uh, is that Pope claims that he is superior to the church council, and only he can call one, so no church council can reform him. That makes him essentially impervious to critique and reform. And all the mechanisms by which he might be critiqued or reformed, he holds in his hands. It's to knock down the first wall that Luther elaborates this view of the priesthood of all believers. And in some ways, he's really thinking here of government officials in this text, interestingly enough. He's not thinking about peasants. He's not thinking about that guy. Okay. Um, but, okay, there is for Luther, what's the essence of it? No fundamental difference between clergy and laity. In fact, all Christians are priests part of the spiritual estate because of their baptism. He says, oh, the fact is our baptism consecrates us all without exception and makes us all priests. Then to knock down the second wall, the scripture wall, Luther denies the papacy the right to exclusively interpret the scriptures, especially since their behavior has been so manifestly evil. Luther writes these consequential words. Now, Listen to these words, someone reading this for the first time in 1520. See what you think it means. If the Pope and his adherents were bad men, and he says that they are, and not true Christians, i.e. not taught by God to have a true understanding, and if, on the other hand, a humble person should have a true understanding, why wouldn't we follow him? 
has not the Pope made many errors? And then he says later on, in addition, as I've already said, each and all of us are priests because we all have one faith, one gospel, one sacrament. Why then should we not be entitled to taste or test and to judge what is right or wrong in the faith? Certainly this guy would say, sure, why not me too? Right? So when Luther writes in 1521, a little later on, one year later, in his introduction to the widely distributed Wittenberg postals, postals are collections of sermons that are sent out to, the idea is to send them out to pastors to read them if they themselves are not competent to write sermons themselves. Okay, and they go through the church here. Sermon guides, right? Any pastors in the room, right? Anyone ever use, a, use any of these sorts of things? Um, you can buy them online now, of course. We're just saying. Um, um, anyhow, so the postals. And you could also read them yourselves devotionally in, in the household. Uh, anyhow, he writes this in his postal. Now the Gospels and the Epistles of the Apostles were written for this very purpose. They want themselves to be our guides, to direct us to the writings of the prophets and of Moses in the Old Testament, so that we might read there and see for ourselves how Christ is wrapped in swaddling clothes. Is it, it is there that people like us should read and study, drill ourselves and see what Christ is, for what purpose he has been given and how he was promised in the scriptures to us. People like us. Like me, right? Or upon reading the statement, the concluding words of the postal, listen to these. Would to God, says Luther, that my exposition of all these doctors of, that my exposition, and that of all these doctors of theology might perish. And each Christian make the scripture and God's pure word his own norm. It is an infinite word and must be contemplated and grasped with a quiet mind. He who is able to achieve that without glosses and exposition will find my glosses and those of everyone else unnecessary. In fact, a mere hindrance. And so, my dear Christians, okay, get to it. Get to it. And let my exposition and all of that of the doctors be no more to you than just a scaffold and an aid for the construction of the true building so that we may ourselves grasp and taste the pure and simple word of God and abide by it. For there alone God dwells in Zion. Amen. One could excuse readers, I think, for concluding that Luther meant for there to be a greater role for the average lay person in the interpretation of scripture in the establishment of true doctrine than Luther actually intended that there should be. Or that he in the light of his subsequent bitter experiences would conclude that there should be. That early enthusiasm, I think maybe sometimes carried him away a little bit in his language. Uh, and that came back to be painful for him later on. Okay, we're going to conclude, I think, with a few remarks on this final section. Luther's understanding of the Word of God. There is, by the way, a woodcut of Luther uh, preaching. Luther preached every week as well. He was the preacher at, his, at the local town church. So he was up. Monk. He was a priest. He was a professor of theology. He was also a preacher, and he preached every week as well. I think you're busy. Let me make some final concluding remarks about Luther's understanding of Scripture and its relation to the concept of the Word of God. I think this is one of the important elements in his thinking about the Scripture that maybe we didn't cover and maybe doesn't get covered that much. For while in the modern church parlance, I think these terms tend to mean the same thing. For Luther, they were different. And this sets them apart from most Christians in the modern world. We will begin with another quotation 
also from the introduction of his Wartburg Postal. This is what he writes. And the gospel should not really be something written down, but it should be a spoken word which brought forth the scriptures as Christ and the apostles have done. This is why Christ did not write anything down, but only spoke. He called his teaching not scripture, but gospel, meaning good news, or a proclamation that is spread not by pen, but by word of mouth. For Luther, God can only be understood relationally, not absolutely. And there's a fair amount of medieval background here, but um, that is to say, God cannot be understood in his essential being. For Luther, God is always God as he relates to an individual. God for me, or Christ for me. And God's essential mode of relation is conversation, speaking. He is the God, for Luther, who speaks, who speaks to me. And most fundamentally, for Luther, makes promises to me that I can stake my life on. That is why, for Luther, we can call God the Word. He is, for human beings, a Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. God, however, is not a regular Word. He's not like a human Word. He is rather a word that accomplishes what it says. At the same time, the word is also action. It creates and does not, like human speech, simply comment on reality. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Thus, for Luther, God wants to speak into the lives of people and recreate them with his speech. That is to say, with his word. He insists, however, that the spiritual word be attached to the physical word. He writes this. Now, when God sets forth his holy gospel, he deals with us in a twofold manner. First outwardly, then inwardly. Outwardly, he deals with us through the oral word of the gospel and through material signs. That is baptism and the sacrament of the altar. That Inwardly, he deals with us through the Holy Spirit, faith, and other gifts. God has determined to give the inward to no one except through the outward. So the inward and the outward work together. You hear the outward word, the speaking of the word, so that the inward word can recreate the person. They function together. And this divine living word, although it is contained in the scriptures and can be made effective by reading the Bible or other Christian literature, really for Luther it is best when spoken out loud. That is preached or proclaimed. As indicated in the first quotation, Luther believes that the gospel was only written down out of necessity. It really should be a human voice to make it effective. Luther says this, Christ calls the oral word living water for a Christian brother. When the word of God flows from the believer's mouth, it is a word of life, able to save people from death, remit sin, lift them to heaven. This is from his commentary on the Gospel of John. Thus the word of God written, that is the scriptures, breaks forth in the word of God proclaimed, which is the sermon, and the word of God performed, which is the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and also, though not necessarily, confession. This is a subject we're going to take up again in Luther and the sacraments, so keep it in mind. So, we end with something of a paradox. <coughs> you see, which is fine, since Luther's theology is built on paradox. A religious reformer whose insights were derived from the scriptures who emphasizes the authority of the scriptures, who encouraged people to read the scriptures, and yet can say, in an offhanded kind of way, that the gospel really should not have been written down at all. The written word is really then for Luther just a servant, a guarantee, a source for the real word, which is the spoken word. 
guess the real word, really effective word, which is the spoken word. That is where, for Luther, the real power lies. And for a group of people who have come out today on a cold February to hear someone speak some words to you when you could have just watched the lecture online or sat home and read a book, uh, you maybe concede with me that Luther might have had a point. Thank you very much.